All right. Well, how many of you been to the have been to the Deering Estate? I see a lot of familiar faces. A lot of people have shown who it have, Deering Estate. Has, yeah, exactly. I, said, I should have asked that question. Who's not been to the Deering Estate? Okay. Well, so we have some folks who've not who've not been to the Deering Estate, and you know. As the assistant director, I get to oversee amazing programs um, there and amazing resources. A lot of what folks know of the, the Deering Estate are about five historic houses. Um, we are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. But in terms of what role this site plays um, in our community, is really it tells the story of man's interaction with his environment through time. And that's, that's, that is such an important topic for today. Um, for us, that story begins you know, back in Paleo-Indian time. I mean, we've got three archeological sites on property. Um, our geology is wickedly amazing. Um, believe it or not, there are nine terrestrial caves on the property. One of them is 332 linear feet long. Yes, you could go inside of the Fat Sleeper Cave. 50% um, of our geologic record is actually intact and visible uh, to the general public. You know, that's like a weird statistic. Um, but that geology also influences a lot of the ecosystems that are there. So you've got geology influencing ecology, influencing culture and anthropology through time. Uh, we do also have um, a Tequesta Native American site there, um, so our site predates the Miami Circle and is a significant uh, archaeological site in that respect. We've got a Cutler burial mound there. Um, the eight ecosystems, we go from a submerged uh, seagrass bed of Biscayne Bay all the way through a mangrove habitat up into a tropical hardwood hammock and a pine rockland. And again, you know, as we're sitting here amongst an exhibit with Christy Gaswork, which highlights some aspects of Everglades National Park, believe it or not, Deering Estate is a microcosm of that overall ecosystem, which is then a microcosm of our greater South Florida ecosystem. So a lot of that story about man's interaction with his environment is told through the estate. And that's kind of where um, we began the this, you know, sort of this process. Um, one of the things, too, that is also relevant to today is when we talk about eco-art and environmental art, the Deering Estate is also host to a federally funded rec um, and recognized uh, restoration project, and that is to rehydrate a slough, a historic slough that existed on the, on the property. Again, very similar to what we're trying to do in Taylor Slough in Everglades National Park. And again, it tells us how we've interacted in this environment, both positive and negative through time, and what types of remediation we do to restore those systems um, so that they are beneficial to, to humans today. And that's, you know, that's an interesting dynamic um, without going too much into um, you know what we do and, and really want to get our artists talking but a lot of the context of where this this process began with eco art and environmental art is what is the difference you know how did we how did we sort of begin that dialogue about eco art in a park setting or even at the estate and why is it important well from a site management standpoint and as a you know a government um, for a government managed property, we have many bosses out there. And, you know, we, it is a, anyone who tells you that we do not exist in a political environment, I think, is fooling themselves. And for us, a lot of what art does in general, forget about its different subsets, is it moves people to think. It moves them to think critically about a subject, about themselves, about the world around them. And as it relates to eco-art and environmental art, it gets us to specifically think about that man's interaction with his environment. Now, we saw this as an amazing opportunity to you know, leverage our founders, Charles Deering's um, sort of interest in philanthropy and interest in art and 
and funding and collecting emerging artists at this time as this is a new emerging topic for us. And so that was really how this began. Um, eco art versus environmental art. Eco art is a subset of environmental art. Eco art has as its element some sort of an intervention or remediation, meaning that you are curing in some way the landscape that has been impacted by humans. And so you are restoring the beauty, the, the natural systems. At the same time, you're moving people to think about those changes, both good and bad, historically and going forward. Um, for us, one of the ways that this started too was a partnership with Xavier Cortada and the idea of um, sort of reclaiming our earth for our native plant species. And we began to um, show or to, to elevate that dialogue with all people who come into the park because we do have these wonderful eight ecosystems. So how do we highlight those 12 native plant species in our park and then how do you take a stand in your own community to reclaim this land for nature? And that was really sort of where that um, collaboration began um, with, with EcoArt in, in our area. Um, we're going to have some challenges with this. I can see as it, oh, as it moved over. Oh, don't worry about so it. So that's that's absolutely okay. <laughs> but we're we're good with it. Well, maybe um some of the participating yeah. artists could yeah. just say their art and dialogue on yeah. it. Yeah. And our curator Lucinda Linderman, yeah. say hi. Hi, uh, my name is Lucinda. If you guys don't know me already, and um, I've been putting this show together, and uh, part of the. Part of the objective of this show is to be inclusive with environmental art and try to show the community or to show people that are coming all of the different ways that artists can participate and can kind of bring the things that are happening in science that most people don't understand to the forefront of the community and help the community understand what's going on and um, to kind of show the wide range of how artists have been working in South Florida because we don't really know about what's happening. I, I, don't, I feel a disconnect between all of the artists that are, this is kind of something that they're interested in or they're trying to work sustainably or they're trying to work with reclaimed materials or they're trying to work with natural materials like coral <laughs> and uh, bring, um, kind of br make change within the community. So this is Colin from Hi. Coral Morphologic. Oh, and I'm one half of Coral Morphologic. Um, <laughs> And I'm a marine biologist, and uh, coral morphologic is now, I guess, we're in our seventh year. And you might have seen some of our stuff. Um, we do a lot with videography, site-specific um, installations, projections, um, photography, videography, and then sort of this overall mission to sort of enlighten people as to what corals are, how they are related to South Florida, how Miami is, um, so much of Miami sort of resembles, as, you know, as a city resembles the coral reef and a lot of the metaphors that sort of can be abstracted from the coral reef and how it pertains to the city and the past, the present, and the future, and uh, how corals, at least in the context of Miami, um, are part of that story. Um, and so we try to try to tell that story, and yeah. What else do we have? We have. Um... Well, I think we've got several, but you know, <laughs> Alan, just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. how did you know? How did you get into this? How did I get into this? Um, I'm curious. <laughs> okay, uh, I've always I was always interested in uh, aquatic environments since mm -hmm. I was a young child, um, and I guess. In hindsight, so I grew up in New Hampshire, which is um, obviously not very tropical, um, but uh, I was fortunate enough uh, when I was, I guess, about five, I visited uh, with my family, visited Cancun, and I saw, it was the first time that I was really excited I got a mask and snorkel so I could go uh, snorkeling, and I was able to see a living brain coral underwater, and um, I guess it dawned on me at the time that this was this is this animal that looks like a brain, and uh, that just struck me as being perhaps very um, magical and interesting. 
And um, I mean, I don't know if that's the ex exact point. I think it was just sort of that really had a it had a profound impact on the rest of my life, seeing a brain coral. Um, and then, so when I had the opportunity to um, go to college, um, I got an academic scholarship to the University of Miami and moved to Miami at the age of 18. Um, but I found at the University of Miami that basically there were very few marine biology students that had much interest in sort of understanding um, the, just understanding corals in general. It was sort of still, still a very different time um, where people was sort of the sharks, sea turtles, whales, and corals were not really as part of the curriculum. And so I really ended up spending a lot more time with musicians and artists at the University of Miami. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, it was in, through that that then I became involved, uh, was introduced into sort of what was happening here in Wynwood, uh, this part of town um, in the early 2000s. Um, and sort of, I, I guess really, answer your question also, I, it's more from a punk rock um, background, I think, more than anything, which has a, has a very do-it-yourself um, aesthetic to it, and um, sort of in, in recognizing, sort of being introduced into the world of um, sort of contemporary, the art community, the young artists and musicians that were very still are very active at the time, I found to be very inspiring. Um, and so I was actually managing a band, which was what I was doing after I graduated. I was asked by a friend to manage their band, which sort of veered me away from going and studying, um, getting a master's degree or, or whatnot. And what I wanted to study to get a master's degree, because I looked into it, nobody, there was nobody else uh, in the entire world that was, uh, there was no mentor for me. Um, I was interested in studying, I am interested in a group of coral reef organisms called coralomorphs, so this is where coral morphologic derives its name. Um, and coralomorphs are sort of uh, a, little, a little understudied group of organisms that are between sea anemones and between corals, and the prevailing hypothesis is that they at one time were corals that had skeletons, and at a time during um, Earth's geologic history when CO2 levels were very high and oceans were much more acidic than they are today. They learned to live, I wouldn't say they learned to live, but they evolved to live without a skeleton. And um, so it, it speaks to the adaptability of some of these creatures, which I think uh, corals, they were just, unfortunately, I, I think, um, I see corals used as pawns in sort of this uh, very much larger uh, discussion about climate change and um, they're just sort of thrown around as sort of everybody understands that coral reefs and corals are um, at risk and are um, and need to be protected, need to be saved, but the way that they're handled is not with very much understanding as to what they are and when you really, when it really, when you really come down to it, corals have more to teach us than we um, have to sort of gain from just using them as like a political football, which is which. So there's 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 a lot more. There's a whole other story that hasn't been told. So, I don't, how, sorry, yeah, to sorry. Interject, but I'm just curious, like, how is it that they're used as a political football? Mm -hmm. I know recently with the Port of Miami um, being built and some of the corals sure. like, with the recent piece with Baki Boxster sure. that you did um, in collaboration with him, the mm -hmm. corals. That are depicted on those, um, mm -hmm. they're like little teller booths. Does mm -hmm. everyone know what we're talking about? It's a new art and public places commission. <laughs> you know, Richard. <laughs> so, um, so this image is of the corals that are in the area of the Port of Miami. But ironically, mm -hmm. many of those have been like blown to smithereens for the for the ports, uh, and, so, right. and not to like to, to to you know to to throw things around. But I'm just curious. Do you do you look at your practice as in terms of an activist? Um, yeah. Uh, it, I mean, I guess it, it all, I mean, we're not, we're not out to necessarily make a political statement for the purpose of sort of just being oppositional or we're not, we're not necessarily, we're not necessarily trying to, um, I mean, it's interesting about, about that specific, the zoanthids that are on those, that are on those, uh, parking booths 
actually. So that's a new species that I discovered. Oh, wow. Um, that's new to, new to science. Um, that's totally amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. And so, at the, but they were growing. They were growing on the port itself. They're actually growing on the on the the front of the port. I found them other places um, here in South Florida. They actually removed all of all of those rocks that they were living that they were originally living on. Um, probably about like they three did. or four years ago. Yeah, oh and God. I discovered through Google Earth. I'm always looking at Google Earth, and I realized like my rocks were gone. Not my rocks, but. <laughs> I like to, you know, it's like, okay, where did they go? And so um, this, type, this type of stuff happens all the time, especially, I mean, it's, I could go in a million different tangents, but what, what fascinates me so much about the corals living in Miami is that these are, like, the most, probably the most adaptable and hardy hmm. of the corals because these are, I mean, this is, this is, where, this is where humans and corals Overlap, mm. and so this is where the, 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 the literal metaphors of the coral reef and the city actually also literally overlap. What's the, what's the metaphor? I'm sort of okay. So the metaphor, so the metaphor is is that the coral coral reefs are like the most urban natural ecosystems on the planet, mm. and so you know you have basically you have life that's stacked on top <laughs> layers, of life, layers life, layers yeah. on life, and um, it's sort of like an eat or be eaten world. Um, culturally diverse mm. with lots of different colors and so I mean this is this is kind of where we come from the perspective that Miami is always like, people understand Miami to be like a neon colorful kind of tropical place it's a confluence of the Caribbean but this is also the, this is the way it always has been so you have you have Miami um, you know sort of this, this the legacy of neon is one that is not necessarily like this plastic gaudy like 70s and 80s neon, but it's actually like predates that extensively. So it's just like just one. This is one of the like literal metaphors in which like there's like for instance, um, it's like Christos uh, and Jean Claude. They're surrounded islands, you yeah. know, which is like classic. I find that to be an inter- an interesting parallel because I see it as you know at the time, and obviously I was wasn't even born, I don't even think, I think it was 81, 82, maybe it was like 82, 83, um, certainly wasn't here, but uh, talking to other people that, that's, that were here at the time, they mentioned that like at the time, the islands in Biscayne Bay weren't even really a part of the conversation of Miami so much, like people didn't really think about them, and maybe this is just somebody telling me that, that this was, that, that the act of wrapping the islands made people aware that these, that we even had these islands, of course these are all man-made islands, did not they're just spoil islands from from Miami's creation, but oh, the islands themselves are actually not natural islands. Correct. That were wrapped. Well, they were used for like so dredging, like, right? Right. So, so like, like all the, all the islands. Fill. 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 Yeah. There's, there's only one or two. Yeah. I think there are real mm-hmm. islands. Right. In the bay. Bird, bird, so it's like if you look at island. Google Earth, it's like Star Island is like this perfect. Pill. Oh, right, right, right. But like some <laughs> of the ones that are just floating in the bay. Are yeah, I mean some. Of, I mean it's like like the the Monument Island, Flagler Monument Island. Um, which is interesting. Like they're they've been trying to do like reclamation, like to mm. bring back native species. But mm. if you if you look at it, and it's something that I just because I'm always looking at old images. Like when they first built that, again, it was dredged out of the mud. It's like South Beach is a, is not. That's also not necessarily all that real estate is manufactured. As is the port, as is MacArthur Causeway, as is Star Island, Hibiscus Island. Like all of this has just been dredged up out of the mud. Much uh, everything basically east of Biscayne Boulevard. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, and um, I have a question. Yeah, sure. So I, I kind of feel that like the, when I went to Mass Academy and mm-hmm. there I was taught by my marine biologist mm-hmm. you know, that the, the state of corals was pretty dim. Like mm-hmm. I kind of got the impression that like because of coral bleaching, mm-hmm. because of all of the you know, uh, uh, maybe our temperatures affecting coral mm-hmm. growth and, and wiping out colonies of coral, mm-hmm. I feel like I was almost felt under the impression that's inevitable that like they would disappear yeah. at some point of our existence on this planet. So right. with with uh, city in, interacting mm-hmm. in such proximity to these corals mm-hmm. that you work with, um, are they, do you do you have the impression that they're adapting to the, to us? Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, and again, I, and I think that this is this sort of goes back to how the sort of the political sensitivity is. One, it's always directed away from us as a species. So we as humans like to think that we're somewhat invincible. 
But when we're talking about, you know, losing all corals or when we're talking about all coral reefs will be gone, you can't, I don't really think that you can have that conversation without conversely also talking about what the state of humanity would be like in the event that all coral reefs are gone, in which case. So basically, you know, to get, to get really cosmic far out, it's like when you, t- you take a step back from, from planet Earth and it's like obviously we're an ocean planet, we're a blue planet, um, and corals, besides humans, are the only other organism on the planet that make structures visible from space. So, and corals and their very nature are like the most cosmic organism that the planet has. Because they're cemented, they're cemented in place. So if they're cemented in place, that means they can't just get up and have sex with each other. So in order to have sex with each other, they all have to be synchronistically tuned to, the, to what is the sun and the moon. So, you know, this is, so this is like an, a, ma- a major event on the coral reef. When the coral reefs uh, reproduce, multiple species are all having sex at the exact same time. and Everything mixes together. And this is, so this is like, these are the oldest organisms on the planet, basically. At least as far as organisms that aren't just like gelatinous or, you know, really, really small floating organisms. Um, so, so you have these incredibly, literally cosmic organisms. And one of the reasons why they're able to actually even sort of like make these calculations is because they're cemented in one place. Like an astronomer, you know, when the Greeks or whomever were, were making their calculations, you have to make calculations from the same exact spot. So this is why corals sort of had this, had this, this ability to sort of be the first cosmic explorers of space and understanding that, you know, three nights after the full moon in August, you know, three hours after sundown, this is when we party. And so, I mean... And they do. And they do. Um, but so corals, so corals are... So it's like not only are they reproducing in like incredibly complex, um, remarkable ways, but then they're also reproducing asexually. So they have... So corals have multiple modes of reproduction, which is like... Which gets into sort of like where we're at now, where now we can... Now with computers, we can like clone things you know you can like make a document and you can make another document and you can make sure that you know if your house burns down and you don't you don't lose everything and the corals are no different where you know you're sort of they have these they have, because when you're cemented in place I mean that means you're really screwed if something bad goes goes like you can't just swim away and this is why corals are at why they're so you know vulnerable to uh, climate change ocean acidification, sea level rock. I mean, all of these things are bad news for corals. Um, however, at the same time, I mean, these are, these are organisms that have survived all of, you know, the, the massive extinction events that have happened. And let's face it, the biggest extinction event that we can face is something from outer space hitting us really hard, which has happened. That's why we don't have dinosaurs anymore. Um, so... Anyway, I'm sort of veering off deep into the <laughs> well, realm. Deep into well, the realm thank you very much for that comment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just to, you know, to say that Sorry, obviously the content, comment. the content of that is, is really fascinating. But I'm sort of like to look at sort of your like the strategy mm-hmm. of what how you're dealing with this content right. is sort of like it's almost like a information campaign about right. this stuff. And you know, arguably it's art or not. Right. Um, I would you know throw that out there, but. Um, you know, maybe there are other strategies that we could discuss uh, in terms of that. I wanted to, um, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to introduce Dale Andre um, of National Water Dance. Um, and um, it's one of, she's one of the few performative um, uh, folks in our festival that are really dealing with um, this idea of water awareness and education as kind of a different part of practice. And I do want him to be able to get your question up. <laughs> I'm sorry. But um, uh, why don't you, uh, and a lot of the folks in the room are visual artists and are, are familiar. Um, she's coming from, um, a dance and education background, but also making amazing collaborations with other um, uh, organizations. And over 89 um, universities in the United States are going to be part of a simulcast event um, for her performance um, on Saturday, April 12th at 4 p.m. So it's a really extraordinary thing that's now become a global um, performance. Uh, why don't you, uh, t- Dale, why don't you talk a little bit about water dance and how, and and how you feel it relates to this, this topic of activism in a way. I mean, you're, you're very yeah. strong on the education uh, as part of your practice. Well, it's this. funny. I just came listening to you. I just all of a sudden thought of 
uh, is it exoskeleton that's on the, mm -hmm. that's that's sort of where we're at in this you're inside you know um, so this is a new process of trying to create dance and make it active um, with a message like this with art and bring dancers into the environment and especially young dancers that are um, in the process of becoming artists because there are dancers who are working out there but not to the extent that visual artists are but um, dancers training keeps them so involved with themselves that reaching out to larger concepts is something you know that I feel is really necessary and that's what got me going on this so it was really coming from the perspective of, of art education, dance education. And water became the issue because of what it is now. It was originally the connecting tissue for us through the state of Florida to connect on the waterways, and then it became the issue itself. So I feel like we're just beginning to really explore what this can mean, and this particular project is the beginning of that, to create community, to create awareness, for the audience and also for the dancers so they can have more to say and think about in their art form. Um, and then with technology, of course, it's allowed us to create this community across the United States. There's another one that's, uh, that's happened called Global Water Dances, and um, that's happening across the world on a rolling concept of performance. Uh, but this one, particularly because it's dealing with arts and education, I wanted to get young dancers and hopefully bring into the curriculum and engage with environmental groups and with environmentalists to create this. So we're just at the beginning. This is the first time we've done it. And I'm very excited about hearing how all of you are working because I feel like as individual artists, you've had the opportunity to move more deeply into the subject. And I've created the structure now, I feel, where it's the beginning of going to that place. Mm -hmm. With, and, oh, and our, our show title, if, um, if you're not aware, is called In Deep. Um, and it really covers our entire uh, uh, Festival of the Arts, which is three days. But um, so many of the pieces uh, literally became about water in the exhibit. It just started to kind of evolve in that way. And uh, part of the language the National Water Dance um, uses is uh, creating a national water ethic, mm -hmm. uh, which, is a which is a really interesting language and, and, and a unique kind of language. Um, well, I think we were thinking... To begin with, you know, where do you start to change people's minds? There's just so much, um, and we get battered with things, but it's too much to do anything about. And you can just start by turning off the tap, you know? I mean, it's the simplest things we hear it all the time, but so many people don't do it. So our message was more, more of just that first level of awareness, you know? If the students themselves can have that, if the audience can have that, um, where do you begin? And then this ability to go so much deeper with art is what's very exciting. You know, it's interesting too, is, is I stand back as a non-artist, but someone who works with artists in this, and someone who, who probably favors more on the science side of the universe. And, you know, why activist? You know, are you an artist or an activist? You know, are you a scientist or an activist? So much more of your message and your message and your message is, is powerful and even more powerful because it's delivered in the medium of art. Art moves people. And when you're looking at something as important as understanding our water, water awareness, what you're trying to do is get behaviors to be changed. I can stand here every day of the week and, and, and every day of the year and tell you why it is so important to, you know, to conserve water and, and with all of the scientific data. But if it, if it doesn't touch you on a heart level, it's not going to happen. And art communicates through your heart in so many ways before it hits you on, a, on the head level, it hits you on a soul level. And so there's so much more of that that's, that's key to this eco art and environmental art practice and dialogue um, that, that's just very amazing. And on that note, it's also things like performance, they're visual cues. So I think that if, if you see something like that and you're running your tap, you know, we're hoping that the change happens, you, you cue back to what you saw and it's like a visual reference, it's a reminder and that's how it becomes activism by changing the behavior of the people that 
see it and to interact with it. Do you want to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about your practice and upcycle and reclaim materials? Um, and then there's other artists in the room that are actually using those materials. We could introduce those as, mm -hmm. as, as you go. Um, sure. Um, I am also a visual artist, and I work with all reclaimed materials, and I don't um, use any glue or um, any dyes in them. I try to keep them as pure as possible so that they can be recycled in the future if they don't make it into a museum or somewhere else. But um, I just, I use my practice, I use reclaimed materials so that I can try to show that the materials that we're throwing away have value and that we need to think differently about the way that we consume um, and all of the trash that we're throwing away. So I'm trying to bring that into the forefront of people's minds when they see my work and use it as a visual cue in the same way in that hopefully they'll change their habits of even as small as, as getting plastic bags at the grocery store. Because, you know, back to activism, like a lot of people think that activism is hitting you over the head with something. And in my experience, it doesn't really work that way because people just get turned off and they get upset and they say, oh, that's a stupid artist, you know. But of course, that's an artist. I mean, it, or like, a tree hugger. Or like, a... it lets them go back to all of the stereotypes that they've already formed in their mind. But if you do it in a kind of more sub subtle way, then you can really kind of create change on a, a level where maybe they don't even notice it. <laughs> so, um, and then that in, in gets them to start thinking about other areas of their life. Because really, I mean, for us to make global change, it just has to be one person at a time. And the way that you live your life has to change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Carl Hilda right here. Thanks so much for putting this all together. Um, I, I'm interested to know how eco art is defined, whether a contemporary artist can be an eco artist and you can go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And has there been a defined Marcel Duchamp of eco art? Um, I was, then I was taking that to another level and thinking, was Moses the first eco artist by <laughs> Was Noah's performance art with the ark, with the flooding? You know, mm -hmm. um, that was a real scene. Yeah. To, yeah. To, to, does eco art always have to be political? Does mm -hmm. can it can it be more sensational? Does it always have to be upcycled? I was just thinking maybe we could. Come, maybe come back down to baseline mm -hmm. terms, yeah. sort of understanding larger context. Of and that was um, um, very much the, the way our um, our NEA grant was written, and it be it became a dialogue. And um, this is one of several um, public forums that we've had on this. And there are camps that are strictly um, eco art, and they feel like there's very few things that can be described as eco art, and environmental art is kind of the overreaching umbrella. Um, but in, in many ways, we were talking about the spectrum of this, that you know, you're self-defining what, mm -hmm. you know, is your, is your practice not activism because, um, you know, uh, it looks a little bit more like art? Um, you know, does it, does it have to be something that people create and continue on? You know, there's, there's so many different well, there's elements. There's just like two terms I would maybe throw out there. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is instrumentalization. So um, in many art practices, there's an opportunity to um, say, okay, the art is used to raise awareness, or the art is used to, um, you know, to create this greater cause to happen, um, which is really kind of um, putting the art into a pejorative position where, uh, you know, the art is not uh, existing in its own self, but it's only existing for this greater message, which is, of course, an, a negative, uh, you know, connotation or thing to say about it. Um, so there, there are many issues in which art is instrumentalized for various reasons. Um, art is instrumentalized, you know, all the time to, uh, to as an excuse to make uh, to gentrify cities and to, to to win grants, which we're all engaged in, and also to um, um, to to promote a cause. Um, and then there are artists that maybe um, that maybe deal with that uh, sort of in a in a. Uh, uh, you know, they're confronting that aspect in which they know that they're being used uh, to some degree um, for this message. So I just want to maybe to put that out there. It was um, just to kind of sort of jump off of that too and punctuate some of the comments. Mm. We struggled. We struggled with our partners on this definition of eco art mm. and environmental art. Like at 
aggressive points. Sure, yeah. Because it was very interesting. There were some aspects of eco art mm -hmm. that objectified you know, the message in there. And uh -huh. it, it, it wasn't about the aesthetic, it wasn't about the movement. And then there were aspects of environmental art that did, you know, were strong opinion changers and, mm -hmm. and game changers mm -hmm. in terms of how you viewed mm -hmm. your world, but it was dismissed as not being eco art. And so I think that it's defining itself. Um, there are people on a global level that, um, you know, consider themselves more in that eco art genre in that some of the things that they look at are, it's got a social component. Eco art has a social component, a social engagement component in the art itself. So that the element of whether it's a visual literary performance, even in its visual sense, has an engagement or performative aspect okay. to it. Sure. The other aspect is that it changes something. It changes something in the environment or it changes something in a culture mm -hmm. to make it an eco art versus an environmental art. Mm -hmm. and See, I, I would totally argue with you there. <laughs> I would totally, and so well, this is, I'm taking that. like someone else's. Yeah. Sure, so they, they really, they really wanted to get a handle. They really did, yeah. and, yeah. and like, and, and I almost <laughs> and like, no. excluded, you know, made it very exclusionary yes. um, in in their approach. Sure, um, as a as a site that is open to all different perspectives, right. all different. Well, that's the pushback, right? Is that it does not mm -hmm. right have a and, yeah. And that's why we were very inclusive in the exhibit, okay. mm -hmm. was to kind of show the different ways that people mm -hmm. practice. And mm -hmm. a lot of the artists don't define themselves as environmental artists or eco artists, but they're working in a way that I feel is mm -hmm. represents environmental art. We don't identify ourselves as either. Well, huh. and, and what's, <laughs> we don't. We don't even necessarily identify ourselves as artists. Either. Right. Yeah. Which yeah. is like what I find so interesting, <laughs> problematic about you guys is right. that you know you're, you're sort of you know you're you're. It's just a means. It's just one of the vehicles. Right. You know, and, and I mean, I guess the way I look, because we kind of sit between, you know, the border between, what is art and science? It's like, okay, if I'm, this is just me talking, um, science deals with the objective, you know, this objective truth that is, that, you know, the subjective reality. Art deals with the, with the subjective, you know, the abstractions of reality or in personal interpretations. Somewhere, those two points meet. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're interested mm -hmm. in. And that brings me, I mean, if I may, to the other point, which is the other term um, of interdisciplinary, which is really like this other mode of working that maybe we're not even calling it eco art, but I think more um, more recent uh, sort of definitions are we're talking about interdisciplinary practices, which are linking, um, you know, some practices together that um, bring that like content um, that you described so eloquently, you know, into um, into play with an aesthetic um, or creative, you know, partnership. Mm -hmm. And we're um, part of the vessel is um, uh, a poetry element, which is actually really new to me because I'm a primarily a visual artist. So I'm getting to work, you know, and, and this institute we're getting to work with these really interesting uh, folks. Uh, o Miami Poetry Festival um, just brought us another group, um, uh, uh, Spoken Soul Festival, and they're going to participate with us. But all of the the poetry that that they're bringing to this event and spoken word. Is, is about the environment. So, okay, oh, all of a sudden there's poetry about mm. the environment that becomes um, a, a new part of the dialogue right. and, and will be there with us. So mm. how exciting is that, that, that all these things are kind of mixed and, mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, um, I'm sure the group that were eco-artists would never have thought that right. there could be a literary component um, mm -hmm. that functioned in that manner. But there it is and it appeared to, you know, it, yeah, appeared, sure. That uh, vein. Yeah. But isn't there something different between a theme and you know a practice? Mm -hmm. um, well, That's and a I good think question. I think it's a good question. And, <laughs> and here's here's sort of another perspective. Yeah. In our lives, we're taught to categorize everything. A zebra, a zebra is different from a horse. You know, structurally they're very similar, but they have different functions. We treat them subjectively very different. A horse is a working animal. A zebra is an animal that, that you know that is free. And it's interesting, you know, when you look at, you're an eco artist, you're not an eco artist. You're an artist, you're a scientist. Mm. Your practice highlights, um, you know, themes in, in violence, in religion. It punctuates, you know, what society is reflecting today. You use as medium found materials, 
or a canvas or you know video or film installation it's hard i mean i think that as society we we want to impose this infrastructure on it and um, i think when we looked at just elevating a little bit the eco art or environmental art mm. as say a mm. practice mm. it's more of a portion of a practice much the way christo put pink skirts around islands to just remind us that oh by the way you know there's islands in our communities there is a perspective in our community that's, that has this theme mm -hmm. or this medium or this message i know i think that's so important because i think that's the the idea the expansiveness of it that it doesn't become institutionalized in that way um, i love the word practice when i hear people talk about their practice and i thought wow i mean that just gives so much weight to it you know and i I thought I could use that word. I thought I'd give some weight to what I do. I mean, I've always just done what I've done. I didn't know it was practice. But if I put that word to it, it feels really weighty, you know? Um, I, I think this whole idea of what do we do, how do we do it, how does the, how does that, the, the concepts, how do these, this, you know, the desire to talk about the environment, the involved in the environment, how does it infect what we're doing? And um, it can come at so many different levels. You know, as a dancer, it's the sensation to begin with. Know, to have the grass between your toes, to be in the mud, to be in the water, and then maybe, oh, the message is there because I'm in that environment. Question to, to all of you. How many of you think it's important to have the environment as a theme in your art practice or are looking at that as a, you know, as sort of a theme? All right. And the others, you know, you're you're interested in in looking at, at this topic sort of academically, potentially. Yeah. I think another something that just popped in my head. It's something it's like within. I feel like within the very traditional concept of the world of art, there's a there's a exclusivity element to it where the best art is sometimes considered to be above the heads of other people or whatever, whereas in eco art and environmental art, perhaps, and this is, I think, why there's sort of a distinction, people might bristle at the idea of categorizing it. It's sort of like, you, tr you try to make, I would presume, you're, you'd be more likely to make eco or environmental art that's more accessible to people. So you want it to resonate with children. You want it to resonate with the general public because you're trying to make a point. You're trying to get something across. Whereas within the sort of gallery walls of art, that's kind of the opposite where there's a little bit of smugness to, you know, do you get it or do you not get it? It's not made for the kids. It's made for people that... Kind of as a separate point mm -hmm. um, from what you're saying is that what right what is the what is the place for this work and if it's if it's work about the environment shouldn't it be you know in the environment and is it more powerful if it takes place in the, in its like site of importance so I was just looking at this Alan Sonifis Time Landscapes of New York City 1965 <coughs> to present which is in New York City and essentially it's a project where um, he climbed a city block and grew all the native species that were native to that block and so. You, you, when you're, you know, cruising through Midtown, you're suddenly you're like seeing this small, you know, humble little garden that's just like the bunch of shrubs that are just native plants. And so, I mean, what's interesting about that is that it's literally in the sphere of the environment. So it's it's outside of the cube and it's dealing with, um, you know, it, it's actually, and I mean, perhaps it's it's a more transformative place for these kinds of projects to have a <coughs> greater impact. There's a there's one of the examples that we had um, looked at when we were first going on this journey to understand more mm -hmm. what are the different layers of environmental art um, that much of eco art actually takes place as you say out in the environment and not necessarily in you know in a box or in the public's view and one of the things that I remember and I'm I'm struggling with the artist and remembering the artist is they took um, you know the mountain topping that was happening in, in a broad community. So we're talking landscape scale type of eco art. This environment had been completely decimated um, you know, for coal production. And part of the remediation of this eco art project was to build in a floral landscape. Clearly not something that was, was there before, but something that became an aesthetic color mosaic 
on on me on this decimated <coughs> land and so it's defined as eco art because it's a remediation it's rehabilitating something it has a community element in it because they brought others in but it brought a landscape not to what it was but something different mm -hmm. and so that's you know that's also yeah. an aspect of it so another sort of intervention yeah. another as sort a, of intervention as interven a mode or as a practice it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting you mentioned the garden piece um, Adler Guerrero is going to do a um, kind of a hanging garden piece uh, he wasn't able to be here tonight um, but but um, he's very interested in um, you know uh, and our ability to create food within our own environment environments mm -hmm. it's been something it's something that's really been taken away from us um, so when we did our when Lucinda and I did a studio visit with him he um, and please feel free to interject this into <laughs> my memory is going um, that it was uh, I mean it, it was really moving he was you know had these very subtle photographs and um, he's like oh these these are edibles in our own environment that that have been almost wiped out in Florida and um, he's going to do a, um, a hanging garden piece at the estate. Um, and then we also have uh, Nancy Martini over here hello, who's doing uh, work uh, uh, titled um, Food Forests. So, so this idea that, that even you know, taking back our sustenance is, is part of uh, eco art practice and environmental art practice. Um, no, I think they're not. Awesome. And I think, too, you know, when we talk about art practices in, in South Florida, you know, the Deering Estate just focuses on a wide a range of contempt, you know, of traditional art. So we've got our historic art pieces inside the house and more is coming back. Um, because of Charles Deering's influence during his time, there's a thematic interest in, in focusing on emerging artists of our time across all disciplines. But also another mark that we feel that we can sort of, you know, elevate this conversation not focus, not be exclusive, is because we are an environmental site, because we're involved in an, in an ongoing remediation, to welcome openly, you know, any of those artists who want to explore that, you know, thematic approach to eco art and environmental art. Again, not to an exclusivity, but just as a, hey, by the way, here's another place to explore this from an interest standpoint. And during um, Lucinda's residency, um, she uh, had several um, interns who created with Carl Reed High School, um, really, really teaching them about um, eco and environmental art practice. Um, a lot of it was hands-on with upcycled materials, but again, taking young artists and, and giving them the opportunity to work with um, non-traditional arts materials is um, really had a lot of impact. Like, how many well, how many kids did you get to? I only had. I had, I think, four during the time. Uh -huh. But, you know, I mean, it's about dialoguing about this stuff and, you know, kind of getting it. I, I think that a lot of artists are already living in a way that they, you know, that they're trying to make the right decisions or, or make decisions that will impact the future of the environment. And then a lot of times it just kind of seeps over into their artwork. So back to defining it, I don't know that a lot of artists do define them but other people define them as environmental artists or as eco artists. Mm -hmm. I think also, I mean, something that maybe unifies them, maybe not all practices, I'm just, again, I'm just thinking mm -hmm. is, I mean, anything that has to do with global awareness mm -hmm. or the fact that... Or neighborhood. Just, or, or, just, or just anything person. that gets somebody to realize that, they're, that they are part of sort of this larger thing and that everything's interconnected that you know that this is I mean we're only 500 years from flat earth uh, everything revolves around earth I mean this is not a lot of time and this is this is this is something that we use you know working with the corals is this perception of time is something that the corals 5,000 years for a coral reef is just a one lifespan of, of a whole coral reef Whereas, you know, humans have been making cities for about 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. So perception of time and the things that we can do, I guess, as artists, as scientists, literally anybody, that helps people understand sort of the context of everything and the fact that everything is connected. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, so the coral, think about the coral as like one organism. 
but it's not really one organism. And this is this is actually where sort of this revolution in thought, I think, is, is going to be coming. So you look at the coral and it's like, okay, you have the coral animal, then you have the algae that lives in the coral. And then, you know, which helps it to photosynthesize, and then it can, you know, act as sort of like a plant. But then you've got all this bacteria and fungus and all this other stuff that lives on it that acts as like an immune system. And so this is called the holobiont. This is like a group of organisms that make up one organism. And this is no different than what humans are. I mean, it's right. like we have, they've cataloged 10,000 different species of organisms that live on the human body. It's like we are not the sterile organisms that we wish that we could be. Mm -hmm. And so the earth is no different. The earth is a hollow biome. And everything is connected. And so, I mean, it's like, okay, this is all just like very, I mean, it might seem like really basic mm -hmm. stuff, but it's really not. It's, it's so, you know, like any type of art that, causes someone you know, and abstracts and causes somebody to see things from that perspective, I feel like still advances a, an, an increase in aware of yeah. global awareness. That's often referred to as systems ecology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just a artist that comes to mind is Hans Hacke, mm -hmm. you know, from the know. projects in the um, 1970s that were really um, bringing, so there's one, I have one right here. Um, Hans Hacke's modeling of biotechnical system in Rhinewater Purification Plant, 1972, invited to produce a two-month project um, for the museum um, House Long in Crayfield, West Germany. The artist set up a chemical treatment charcoal and sand filtration plant to produce polluted water from the Rhine River. The purified water collected in a large acrylic basin containing goldfish, which demonstrated the successful restoration of all life-supporting, albeit artificial, habitats. Um, and so, I mean, it continues on, like, these projects that, you know, connect with the, the real world in a way that, um, that does produce a larger yeah. uh, awareness of yeah. the way that systems are connected. Um, we have uh, Margie Nothard in the exhibit, too. She's actually um, an architect um, as well as an, um, she, she identifies herself as an environmental artist as well. Um, and she's doing a uh, one of her groundwater series pieces at Deering, where oh, cool. she has a groundwater, uh, black water, and gray water mm -hmm. uh, that she's going to collect on site. And again, just another piece that raises awareness of where does where does our uh, the water we use, what happens to it? Mm -hmm. um, it goes. She's getting the gray water from it on goes, site. It, um, <laughs> she's going to call you. I've given, I've given her groundwater. I've given her I've given her Jennifer's <laughs> phone number. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I hope that if she's making this piece that she's also, you know, thinking about this legacy and this lineage mm -hmm. of artists that have been dealing with this subject matter in this yes. way, you know, in it. Yeah, and, um, yeah, this will be, uh, she did uh, a similar piece at the Young and Arts Museum for the, for the opening, but, um, and it, and there is a, a large part of her practice that's, that's educational and, and she is, uh, you know, dealing with even, even building, um, buildings and maybe I don't know Felice maybe you could pipe in on this one and save me on this um, that, that part of her her architectural practice deals with you know navigating human structures in these in these delicate environments and um, I don't know it's too much about the architectural practice itself that are you going to sorry, chime in do I do okay <laughs> Felice Grodin is also one of our uh, uh, artists in the deep exhibit it's like that that concept right there would yeah. would have been radical in its time, and now it's. I mean, so this is not an example of like an artist thinking, sort of radically at the in it in in the time, which now you. I mean, it's not uncommon for waste for sewage treatment plants to to treat human sewage and turn it into drinking water. Yes. Which thirty years ago would have been an art. I mean, if if you did that and you said okay this is connected to the toilet over here and you're going to drink this, you could say that this is an art piece, but this is, this is real. This happens now. People don't like to talk about it, but I mean, it's like now like that, that type of like using natural purification methods to create clean water is now just a, it's a thing. So I guess it's an example of how sort of um, creative artistic thinking actually leads to, you know, it's not such a bad idea. Well, one of the things, too, that I thought was interesting in this, and, and not to undermine some of our our, um, our our partners in this, but we actually threw some of our artists in with scientists, like actually got them into the lab. Um, artist, 
and then scientist. I mean, both of you come from a science background and then pursued, you know, sort of an, an art practice or, or overlaid that onto to what you're doing. But that was an interesting social dynamic too, where they were looking at diatoms and the the you know mapping of diatoms. And diatoms are some of those ancient creatures that can tell us a lot about um, changes in our environment over time. And so you had artists who don't consider themselves sort of envir you know or frame themselves in an environmental context and then pure researchers who do not frame themselves in any type of artistic um, context were coming together mm. with this dialogue mm -hmm. which was and they, it changed both of their perspectives mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. is what we learned too. Mm -hmm. Francis? <laughs> um, now this, all this is bringing to mind a lot of interesting ideas and I think that's something that's really valuable about environmental art is that it kind of breaks down some of the barriers that we construct in um, and also about who gains authority in terms of discussing nature. And I think that something mm -hmm. that I kind of come across a lot in terms of uh, witnessing the eco art is not just that the artists themselves get some agency in presenting the more layman's view of nature, but also in terms of what have we been led to believe is a certain inalienable universal truth when humans are continuously defining what is nature and mm -hmm. throughout generations kind of like you were saying, 500 years ago we thought the earth was flat. So we're never certain about what we're saying, and that's what's really um, powerful about the environmental art or genre. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I guess this is the same, it's riding a similar like, like wave of, if you, if, if you subscribe to you know, man being higher than nature. I mean, this boils down to a fundamental worldview that somebody's either going to have. They're either going to, you know, sort of the traditional Judeo-Christian, you know, God made man higher than everything else underneath it. I mean, that's like, you either choose to accept that or you choose to accept that we are a part of, you know, that, that man is, is, is the end of a very long, long process of uh, upward more complex evolution creating more complex um, systems and I mean you know life only gets more complex um, so I mean that's two different ways to look at the world you know you choose that, that either man is above nature or man is part of nature and I think since I don't know I feel like at least in my lifetime I, mean, I didn't really grow up going to I mean that religion was never a part of my life very secular I guess um, so that was never anything that I was taught but I mean if but that's almost subconscious I feel to a lot of people of just this idea that humans are above and therefore if you're above then you're stooping down to deal with the dirt or whatever and therefore I mean that's just a fundamental disconnect that I guess you know I mean and this is this is why you're not going to change some people's minds about so what, what's interesting is art is a practice as art, I, you know, you've heard that term that like art is inspired by the divine, you know, mm -hmm. it is on par with that mm -hmm. sort of inspiration. And yet when you look at the environment, there is that, there is that view of those two things being separate. Mm -hmm. So as we look at melding different practices, what is that going to do? Is this going to like shake the universe, you know, break down some of those perspectives and, and things on, on where we think we fit in the world um, in this in this lovely hierarchy that we've created? I want to say that the divine is that. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is that connection. They did a wonderful thing with Cosmos with showing the DNA of, mm -hmm. um, of trees and mm -hmm. our DNA and the whole, the, the whole inter you know, interconnection of the entire thing and that's divine. And yet some people can look at that, and we're going through this in some of my environmental classes, you know, that they can look at that and still see it as completely separate, like not get the, that <coughs> connectivity. So I, I, I think a lot of what you're saying is really a, a conscious choice that we make as individuals in how we you know, even perceive the art around us. Is, is it a part of us or is it a separate from us? Is the environment a part of us or separate from us? There's a statistic out there that uh, states that about a third of the population makes up their own subjective truth, whether or not they see fact. 
Well, now I know that it's a third. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> which, bring, which brings a question. You know, we're, maybe we're in a bubble, mm -hmm. but how do you raise the awareness mm -hmm. of what you're doing? You know, with what we used to call the silent majority or the masses. Mm -hmm. Even here in Miami, I mean, how many people are going to come? during a state to see this and, and really be encouraged to do something about it. I mean, we all probably turn off the tap and we brush our teeth and turn it back on again because we want to save water, but other than raising the price of water, what do we do to encourage what we're trying to encourage people to understand? Um, the question that an audience those questions and those awareness. Like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, like, break this question and, like, I'm going to give you answers. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, now I'm going to talk about this and, like, this is about nature and all the stuff. But I just want, like, how do I approach my, my viewer? How do I, like, uh, make these people conscious? And it's also about, like, uh, that altruistic uh, feeling as an as a environmental artist mm -hmm. that you, you are. Just like, okay, we are the, the together connected to the earth and like, how are we going to preserve this beautiful earth and like, how are we going to destroy the earth and like, we, from everywhere you can approach, you can like, raise those questions and like, answer them by the viewer. I guess that's the key. I, I think you're, you're point is spot on and what I would say too is that it's not something that's going to happen in one event at one time with one type of practice you know any of the messages be they sex religion you know what's happening in our culture today violence um, or environmentalism you know those changes those perspectives have happen over time and I, now we know that we can discount a third of the of the population, <laughs> and changing, <laughs> right? And changing that, you know, yeah. we hope to have between two thousand and three thousand people coming out to this exhibit on that day, mm -hmm. and 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 we hope that it places us enough on the map that it will continue to bring people back and to look at that at, in a different perspective. I. Sometimes Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, and and like I, it goes back to the fundamental difference between art and environmental art, where or whatever we're talking about. Um, <laughs> right. Where it's like you, as an artist, if you're making environmental art, I would imagine you you almost want the viewer to know what your intent was which to a certain extent can backfire, which is what we've been talking about, how if you, if you have an agenda, if you have something that you are trying to cram down someone's throat, even if it's, even if it's of the most beautiful and logical thing, if, you, if, you, if you're so upfront with your motive, you often have the unintended effect of, of causing people to wall off. Whereas in like regular artistic practice, I feel like generally the artist tries to have some mystery. You you don't you don't want all of your motives for making a piece of artwork so transparent. You want somebody that mystery adds to somebody's you know to come back around and think about it more. Maybe they come to their own conclusion, and, and that's something that I was you know um, I was reading recently about Georgia O'Keeffe, and uh, you know it's like you say Georgia O'Keeffe. And people, probably the first thing that there's going to jump into their mind is, you know, vaginal depictions of flowers. <laughs> and that's, but the, and, and this is what, this is what jumps into people's minds. But like when she was confronted about it and said, you know, there's all these Freudian undertones to your work. She's like, what are you talking about? She categorically denied the fact that there, that there was any intent on her part to sort of put this in the face of a viewer who, and these are just flowers. And yet, the way that she was painting them and making them, you know, macro and sort of really in your face, 
it was sort of undeniable, but at the same time, I mean, both sides are right in that situation. She's saying, no, I'm not. This is just a flower. And then on the other side, you have, you have people, you know, saying, well, you know, definitely, but look how analogous this is to this unspeakable thing that we don't talk about in our society, you know, in the, <laughs> right. whatever, the 30s, the 40s. Right. But both of those are true. But... When I, uh, when Amanda actually kind of challenged us to to frame the roundtable about this idea of activism, I of course like went and started googling like okay, you know, eco art, environmental art, environmental activism, and one of the um, funny little book titles that that came up, which I promise I'm going to read. We'll all read it, Richard, right? Um, <laughs> uh, it was called "A Beautiful Trouble: A Toolbox for Revolution," and it had this wonderful. Um, little quote about this this collection of essays um, on activism. A lot of it um, was specifically about environmental activism, but I just love I love this and it kind of it navigated some of this this uh, conflict for me. Um, uh, blurring the boundaries between artist and activist, hacker and dreamer was kind of the, the title of the book. And I just it just kind of rang really true. It was kind of well where do where do where do we fit in? Are we uh, you know are we uh, uh, are we activists? Are we artists? Are we um, you know, <coughs> creating uh, awareness, or maybe we're just being self-indulgent at times um, by working in environmental themes? And it can be all those all those things. Um, a lot of like you, you, there are artists in the room that work with with natural imagery, um, and someone might say, "Oh, well, they're not really environmental artists," and and or um, you know they might be more interested in nature as a theme. Like you would, you would say, uh, but there's just so many different types. Of I mean, I think uh, coming from right. the point, the standpoint mm -hmm. from any artist, I think we all mm -hmm. deal with materialism, and it's really hard to escape. I mean, mm -hmm. even if you're a musician, you're you're, you're mm -hmm. plugging into the wall. You know, you're using a resource mm -hmm. that's tapped, and and I think in ways like how you make work that is meant to decompose and recycle towards the earth. There's artists like Nico Slobo's current show, A Diet, mm -hmm. you know, which is just like a toxic material. And I asked him the other day, I'm like, so do you think our art is supposed to last forever? Because that's the, our intention. We make art to last our existence, at least. Mm -hmm. And um, because, and then he answered, well, you know, it's not, it's not about um, the peace lasting forever. It's about the bigger pictures. It's about the bigger problems. You know, and like so, sometimes there might be more, uh, more violent ways of approaching art that almost make a greater impression. Mm -hmm. But then there's the subtleties of impressions also. So it's really a conversation between the range of that. I mean, some are more toxic ways of making something that maybe help us reflect. That are r way more sure. powerful. Like uh, I'm thinking of like Robert Smithson's asphalt landslide. Yeah, no, I was going to say like sometimes a lot of the, like there's a lot of like especially the early earthquake or earthwork artists, mm -hmm. they were accidental environmentalists. I mean they weren't really necessarily trying. It's like like this Smithson's spiral jetty. I mean mm -hmm. how earth oriented awareness can you get? Mm -hmm. I mean mm -hmm. especially well, if you go there. <laughs> you well, the, the go um, there. asphalt landslide is different because the asphalt yeah. landslide is is a deliberate. Um, right action actually to um, be anti uh, like sure. friendly to the earth right. because right. just basically poured a big truckload full of asphalt down yeah. the hillside um, with the um, with the sentiment that you know look actually it doesn't matter like our earth is so 
um, vast and its, its systems are so powerful and it's just a tiny blip in the radar and it will heal itself. And so that was sort of like the perspective on that. Um, well, that's what he's trying to say with the certain corals will adapt to environmental degradation, but that's, that, and that's kind of like what Smithson was trying to say, kind of, right? I, mean, I think so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like, look, this is a blip in geologic but that, that, time. But that can also be an excuse to, to encourage more environmental degradation. It's like, well, or we to say, no, what do, you, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, but but I like I mean even even people like Terrell, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean those, those pieces are not. I don't, you know. I, I think they're more like spiritual rather than environmental. Mm -hmm. But they do kind of show. They kind of create this sort of um, awareness of, of the earth, of where we're at, this sort of spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. and, and and they're not necessarily trying to be environmental art, but but they are environmental art. Mm -hmm. And the Spitz and Spiral Jet is very environmental it's because now they're trying to preserve this. But at the same at the same time, it's also. Uh, it's also a demonstration of man's power to be able to utilize yeah. machinery to build things that are hypersymmetrical, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, we well, never, we never was pretty low that. tech, though. I right. Mean, it was very, definitely wasn't a big machine thing going on. He just had dumb trucks. Mm -hmm. Just dumb trucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was very low tech. Marina mm -hmm. expansion is very high tech. I mean, yeah. Can I ask, please, since you're on the topic of water? Um, you know, like rainwater collect, connect, collection and other um, sustainable features for development. Have you gotten involved, or do you have a group that gets involved, like a liaison to city government? Or does everyone do it on their own? Or We are city government. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the biggest challenge. We are, we are, we are the city government. We are and the machine. So, yeah, we really are. And, and the challenge. We're paid by the government. And, yeah. You're not and, the we're paid, right. We're paid by the government. And, and one of the challenges as a person is that I have my own views of what I think is right and wrong in the world. Urban boundary lines. You know, reclaiming our sewage water and using it as drinking water. Rainwater collection. I mean, rainwater yeah. collection. You know, the the way that we get those messages out are through scientists, citizens, artists, students, teachers, friends, spouses, children, um, because it's very hard being in a government position to take a stand. It's the easiest way to get your head chopped off, um, and it's the easiest way then not to be able to make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And we know we're in a site um, where we're, you know, we're showing um, works made of uh, reclaimed materials. Uh, Leandra's uh, piece was uh, constructed entirely of reclaimed water bottles, and uh, Miami-Dade County Park Systems don't have a recycling program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually, we have another piece where, exactly. <laughs> where it one doesn't of the, exist at our park. It doesn't exist at most parks. Mm -hmm. um, so these are. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And we have an artist that actually went around to a lot of the Miami Dade parks and collected the aluminum cans out of the trash can to mm -hmm. show. And she collected like 700 in about two weeks yeah. mm -hmm. that were just in the trash. And she's creating a piece using those. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, you know. And that's a powerful statement. Yeah. to my bosses in many ways because I've, I've, I've reiterated that. Like, you know, by the way, we are, we are an environmental site and, oh, we've got this NEA-funded grant where we're actually putting on an eco-art and environmental art exhibit to highlight, you know, man's interaction with this environment. And dude man, dude bros, you guys can't get off your butts to, you know, to get a recycling program in here. We have to take our recycled paper home at the end you of the day. Like the, uh the gun lobbyist that, um, I can't remember her name, but she really did a lot of uh, work and high-powered gun lobbyist in Tallahassee. Like, and I think that's sort of what it takes as lobbyists to, and she was actually pro-gun, and that's one reason why, you know, they had really great, the NRA is really great lobby. Lobbyist, and I'm just wondering if you, because you are kind of more involved with government, if you I, involved with that. And I think artists, you know, we're doing our art, and it's sort of part, but, you know, if there was a way, like, groups um, that you could kind of get involved that way. Well, I think we do that on the administrative side. I think what has been amazing for us in working on this project and other projects and in collaborating with artists is that we've hit audiences 
with whatever the topic, you know, be it art, be it creativity, be it thinking just outside of the box a little bit, you know, thinking about a sense of place. What it is, what, what is Miami? You know, what, what is Deering Estate relative to Miami? What is Coral relative to Miami? I mean, all of those messages as a result of art as a practice is out there, is being highlighted, is, you know, there's Facebooking about it, there's press releases going out, um, there, are, there is an exhibit and stuff, and I think that that's an amazing thing that each one of us has the ability to do because we are a little bit, each one of us then, changing our community. We are writing the historic record today about what our community sentiment is by creating this dialogue and enhancing it and growing it. Um, I, but what you're saying is, I think it, it is so true about how do we, how do we galvanize this, these efforts and make it, make it known. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, what we're trying to do with National Water Dance Center really is one of those things where you're dropping a pebble in the ocean, you know. But it's the beginning. Is that we're trying, we're all writing to our legislators. At least I'm trying to get everyone to, so that every, you know, every every site is going to write to their legislators, hopefully. We're writing to the Board of County Commissioners, to the school board, because we're working with students. Uh, and just that this will mean nothing the first time. But if we were able to organize in any way that with every exhibit, we were doing things like that, so there was just constant information. Um, the Florida Cultural Alliance does incredible stuff for the arts that way, but we as artists for the environment could And you're handing like out that. shower heads. You know, I know, and you I, know, the I, interesting I, thing is when I told the person who's doing the press release for us, she said, "Well, great," and that you realize means nothing, but you know, but it's a be it's a beginning. I mean, you know, but if, if a thousand go out, that, yeah, if a you know, thousand go out, that's yeah. a thousand it's getting, or at least well, moving it a little it's bit. It's getting off the mark. information out, but then you've got to get people to unscrew their shower yeah. head. But if you don't do it, it never starts. But it is something about trying to get something mm -hmm. going like that that we can become our own lobbyists by every time something happens. And, uh, but it's a huge amount of work. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's something to think about because that makes the political voice. Well, mm -hmm. one of the things uh, that I found um, that's helpful in that is, you know, like um, you were saying, is personally getting involved um, more than just your artwork and incorporating that um, in your message. Um, you know, my, my work with, you know, protecting the Florida Panther, I, I got involved because I found the Little Florida Panther and um, utilized my photography, because I'm a major photographer, uh, to get that message out. And in doing so, I, I got involved with the Friends of the Florida Panther Refuge, and they were more than happy to use my images, um, which I was more than happy to let them use. Um, so that's, that's a very powerful thing. Isn't that like a whole, you know, like the answer to like the semantics issue? Like that's really what, you know, what the criteria for an environmental artist or uh, is basically like a call to action. Like because it's, mm -hmm. I mean, like you said, like the, I mean, you're interested in, just because you were interested in the subject of the Florida pattern, um, you know, somebody is trying to preserve the Florida pattern actually. When I use your art and call you environment artist and like you call awareness through your art. So, I mean, because if it's just like an awareness thing, Anything, it's really, mm -hmm. you know, well, then, you have a real culture to then, protect mm -hmm. or change the situation. Well, there's a difference too between, I mean, the, the, if, when you're talking about lobbyists versus artists, there's a huge difference mm -hmm. because lobbyists work for enormous corporations mm -hmm. that are making money, and so they pay the lobbyists mm -hmm. absurd amounts of money in order to get legislation passed or not passed, whereas artists who want to make, who want to affect legislation are often working to do something that will not make anyone money or will prevent people. <laughs> <laughs> they're not getting paid. Yeah, but there are, environment, there are environmental lobbyists like Sierra Club, yeah. that, which, which are not profit driven. They're not profit driven, yeah. and so that it's but all. They're, but they're usually outgunned because they don't, they can't raise enough money to, mm -hmm. to compete with major corporations. It's hard to put a dollar amount on like a sequoia tree. How do you keep it pristine? They do it every day. But people don't understand how much it, the beauty of it and its preservation, what that means. There's no, there's no number that you can add to it that helps 
a lobbyist to try to keep it from getting cut down. That's yeah, the fundamental actually, issue. Actually, there, is, there are numbers that can be. They're coming. I just saw some of that on TED. It's just coming out yeah. now. But yeah. economic you know, most people, the most, the Everglades, most governments, they, they have no idea. You know, the Everglades but, Foundation published a whole study that was done on the economics of protecting the Everglades yeah. and what it means economically uh, for you know, South Florida as well as the whole state of Florida. And um, so it, it can be done. Yeah, it, it can be done, but that, that message needs to get across to everybody that's still, you know, disposing their pet snakes and who mm -hmm. knows what in the Everglades. That well, message needs to get to that other end. I was more curious to know about the, the FBL situation in the Everglades on the east side of it. Mm -hmm. And then we could speak more about that. I was just as far as like more like up-to-date information or what we're saying about The latest I heard was that the superintendent was kind of leaning towards that happening. What do you think? That's the power lines going on. the one that got to Adam's budget. And I mean, the all those people said they can raise those questions way before us. All of them. So my, my, my question I want to raise also is just like, do we want to be an activist or do we want to be an artist? Both, or, or you want to utilize those, like, or like those materials that like doesn't become material. Okay, I'm using 700 uh, cans or whatever. How then can I use them as a non-cancer? Like, it's those questions that like, like I become to my mind. Okay, how sort of I can like protect my message and like be like a light on the dark and not don't like. Of the cliche, always like, oh, so you became an artist and like sell those things like for five bucks if you want to. But like, we as an artist, we have we can like raise those like questions higher and like wider as much as we want to. So you can ask those questions to yourself. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little confused about like the legacy of Charles Daring because you know, <laughs> here, here is this support system for artists to live within this amazing space that has. With withstood generations of changing in mining environments. Maybe it's one piece of real estate mm -hmm. that hasn't changed over a long time besides Biscaya mm -hmm. and maybe a few others. But in a way, he was trying to get away from the city. He was far mm -hmm. away, you know? So I just want to think about, you know, his own perspective away from the city. If he could see it now and want to support the arts, would, would he have the same perspective? I mean, because <coughs> the way that we affected the environment you know, art is a reward, but um, you might then, you might think that we need it even more now. You you probably I mean, ho hopefully we, you think it that way, but it's it's just interesting to see. You know, now he has a lot of neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> um, amazingly enough, and you know, the study of Charles Deering is is sort of a lifelong study. We sort of figured with this multifaceted person, but. I think that he also represents a, a, a part of each one of us. You know, the Deering Estate was chosen because of its environmental features, and it was chosen also as a place where artists would respite. They would come there, come and go as friends. There were notes and stuff like that. And, and I don't know that there's many places like that. We're still trying to create that legacy. We would hope that, you know, if he came there today and saw this crazy, you know, suburban environment all around him, he would be mortified. But then once he went into the hammock and saw the picture, the area that John Conkle Small took in, in 1913 when he was studying on the estate, the botanist from, from New York, and looked at that same exact space today because you've got the geology and the hammock in front of it, it hasn't changed much. So, you know, I mean, I, I think that that's important. I'm curious to know what are some of the takeaways that you guys have, uh, you know, as part of this roundtable. What what resonated with you in this in this dialogue? What changed a perspective, or what kept it similar? The connection to the universe. Mm -hmm. I think it's difficult to gauge the effectiveness of these interventions, however we want to put it. Mm -hmm. um, I just in the last week we saw this uh, multidisciplinary performance piece by Robert Redwood's wife at the Young Art Foundation, just on the scene, and that incorporated mm -hmm. dance. Uh, did anyone see it? Yes, I did. You okay. saw it. So, you, you know, it was music, dance, spoken word, 
uh, visual art, video, I mean, mm -hmm. this, this uh, the phenomenon of the flow, and it really addressed not just ecologically, but more like the earth being out of balance, like a mm -hmm. bigger, kind of a more broader um, message. I mean, do you want to fill in on what, how you felt about <laughs> Yeah. Because it's like, I mean, we're talking yeah, about the yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, no, I think, I think, um, I mean, it's complicated to just speak about it. It was a big event. Yeah, you know? it was it was massive. It was, I was like, holy yeah. crap, I feel like I'm in San Francisco. Finally, I'm seeing something good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was exciting to see all those people come together. Yeah. And each aspect of it was um, well done. I don't think it addressed the issue very well. It, yeah. I think that Robert Redford was the one that really brought out in the readings. Yeah. And then there were beautiful moments of the light on the screens, and the music was phenomenal. Yeah. But unfortunately, I thought the dance was um, was um, what's what I want. It was well produced, but it didn't speak to anything. And that's what so often happens. And I think that's what, I mean, even with what we're doing with our um, National Water Dance, it's so much about bringing the students into this environment to begin something, but to really help, hope that dance can, can resonate and have it. I don't think that collaborators spend their time together. I don't think they really understand what they're trying to say, because the dance can change just as because I, I was like, yeah, what are they doing? I'm not quite getting right. the environmental feel of the dance part, but the rest of it synced more yeah. with that. That's Especially the music. But like overall, at the end of the day, I mean, do you think like they raised so much money, awareness, whatever, for the cause? Or I mean, I, mean, I know, think I like think Robert having we're having. I mean, I mean, how much action did that actually generate? I think it's like yeah. you really like the ball. Like, yeah. Was there really a call to? No, I, Money no. went to, to, I don't know, us. Yeah. I mean, Robert Redford I mean, every time talking. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Redford saying what he said was important, I yeah. think. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was, it was, a, it was, yeah. like, you, don't, not, you don't expect such, like, yeah. you know, like, well, old, it, straight, it's, white it's guy also, to be <laughs> talking about cosmic consciousness, yeah. you know, well, like, it's cumulative. It was cool. That's, I mean, maybe that's <laughs> but what's everything else I able. totally agree with. <laughs> everything was, a, you know, it was all, but... You know, when Robert Redford comes out, and, and it's not really po it wasn't really poetry, but it was like you just don't ex you just don't expect. I don't know. I mean, it was it was it was, it was nice. I think just more people talking the way he was talking is just good because it makes it, things commonplace. Like when people can speak cosmically co and commonplace mm -hmm. vernacular, it's just that's the way things change. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the world is round. Saying though, with art, I think you know, I think it's cute. So that one event, no, but it was it was a big event, and it was Robert Redford, and it was beautiful language. Right, so there's that event people. happening. You guys are doing one something. Thing, other artists are doing. You know, there were Z Galleries, galleries did one recently. I mean, there there does seem to be a little bit more of a focus on this. That's right. mm -hmm. um, something that I took away from it has kind of been like in my mind for a little while is that we kind of live like in an era of movements, and that's what like propels a lot of our actions. We think about participating this global framework, which is this kind of, we're all living in the internet, and so we can access other people around the world, and how can we cause this ripple effect? And what's interesting is that um, there's, I feel like, this tension between what you're presenting as your individual perspective of your artwork and of what you're trying to kind of bring awareness to, and this, this impact that you guys are talking about. And definitely, like what you mentioned, I think it's kind of, calling back to what you mentioned about that blip experience of that artwork with the, what was it called? Um, asphalt landslide, landslide or asphalt, asphalt run. Maybe yeah. called asphalt rundown. Well, the interesting thing about that is it being like an anti-environmentalist um, piece mm -hmm. is that it's saying, well, this one kind of impact doesn't have a major influence on the world. But as we think about climate change and examining all of the history related to anthropogenic forces on the climate, obviously we have cumulative impacts. And so it is environmental art it becomes a cumulative movement. It's not really necessarily about those individual, the people that walked away and were like, huh, that really changed me, but rather people creating green spaces in cities, urban planning, that changes the way that we look at bike lanes, that we think about public transit, the way that we, I mean, you know, farmers markets all of a sudden became really popular in my opinion. We thought that like 15 years ago. So it's kind of, I think that's bringing in the interdisciplinarity of art, science, and everything else. We're all looking towards a common reference and the artist provides kind of a connection to the to the personal and to, into a way of, of seeing it as something less obscure and less alienating. And also, sorry, I'm almost done. I just have so many ideas on it. <laughs> You're writing it next time. Right. <laughs> 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 I know Colin and I work at the Bering Estate, so there
um, thinking about kind of eco-fetishism and thinking about the way that we allow ourselves to be manipulated by market ideas of what the environment mm -hmm. is, the artist is so important in that kind of punk rock element of trying to change the way that we see these environments as simply this commodity and the way that we can just look at it as a market value. So. Thank you. I think, I think that's a really great spot to end. That was really well put. And, um,